Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are gathered together. I believe this is the first of the Gregorian first month, which is still the beginning of winter for us because we're on the 18th of the 10th month on our Creator's calendar. <clears throat> but we are fellowshipping this yawn, and we have a little sidetrack from what we've been reading to cover a particular section, a variety of scriptures that are covering the topic of what we are to do to comprehend scripture correctly. So this is a post that was put together a while ago and it recently came up in my memories so I wanted to share. This is comprehending the scriptures from the heart and mind of the author, Yahuwah, no falsehood, no compromise. It says, but he, Mashiach, Answering said, it has been written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahuwah. That's from Matthew Yahu 4.4. 4. Father's blueprint from his heart to our hearts for our hearts. It says the grass shall wither, the flower shall fade, but the word of our Elohim stands forever. The sum of your word is truth, and all your righteous right rulings are forever. And then you can see the nomenclature for those. So this was put together in 2016. It says, this is a series of scriptures on who we should listen to, what we should do to learn truth, and the importance and reasons for staying in scripture and not other writings that are contrary. The first reference is from the Recognitions of Clement, book three, chapter 50, or I'm sorry, 62, Life of the Nazarene. It says, yet Kepha said, who is he that is earnest toward instruction and that studiously inquires into every particular except him who loves his own Ruach to deliverance and renounces all the affairs of this world that he may have leisure to attend to the word of Yahuwah only. Such is he whom alone Yahushua deems Hakam or wise. Even he who sells all that he has and buys the one true pearl, who comprehends what is the difference between temporal things and ageless, small and great, men and Yahuwah. For he comprehends what is the ageless hope in the presence of the true and Tob Yahuwah. But who is he that loves Yahuwah, save him who knows his chokmah, or wisdom? And how can anyone obtain knowledge of Yahuwah's chokmah unless he is constant in hearing his word? Whence it comes that he conceives a love for him and venerates him with worthy honor, pouring out hymns and prayers to him, and most pleasantly resting in these, accounting it his greatest damage if at any time he speak or do aught else, even for a moment of time. Because in reality, the Ruach that is filled with the love of Yahuwah can neither look upon anything except what pertains to Yahuwah, nor by reasons of the love of him, can be satisfied with meditating upon those things that it knows to be pleasing to him. And it says you can't be satisfied except with meditating upon those things that, know, that it knows to be pleasing to him. Yet, those who have not conceived affection for him, nor bear his love lighted up in their mind, are as it were placed in darkness and cannot see light. And therefore, even before they begin to learn anything of Yahuwah, they immediately faint as though worn out by labor. And filled with weariness, they are straightway hurried by their own peculiar habits to those words with which they are pleased. For it is wearisome and annoying that such persons, or to such persons, to hear anything about Yahuwah, and that for the reason I have stated, because their mind has conceived no sweetness of El Breed love. The next section is Philippians 4, 4 through 13. It says, Rejoice in Yahuwah always. Again I say, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Yahuwah is near. 
do not worry at all, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to Elohim. And the shalom of Elohim, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and minds through Mashiach Yahushua. For the rest, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is righteous, whatever is clean, whatever is lovely, whatever is of tobe report, if there is any, up, any uprightness and if there is any praise, think on these. And what you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, practice these, and the Elohim of Shalom shall be with you. Yet I rejoiced in Yahuwah greatly, that now at last your concern for me has revived again, though you were concerned but had no chance. Not that I speak concerning need, for I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. I know what it is to be humbled, and I know what it is to have an excess. In any and every situation, I have learned both to be filled and to be hungry, both to have an excess and to be in need. I have strength to do all through Mashiach, who empowers me. And the next is from Yahuda, actually, like you were saying earlier, brother. It's actually, I think this is the whole one, but Yahuda. 1, 1 through 25. It says, Yahuda, a servant of Yahushua Mashiach and brother of Yaakov, to those who are called Kadosh by Elohim, the Father, and preserved in Yahushua Mashiach. Compassion and shalom and love be increased to you. Beloved ones, making all haste to write to you concerning our common deliverance. I felt the necessity, rather, sorry, I felt the necessity to write to you, urging you to earnestly contend for the belief which was once for all delivered to the set apart ones. For certain men have slipped in whose arbitration or judgment was written about long ago, wicked ones perverting the favor of our Elohim for indecency and denying the only Adon Yahuwah and our Yahuwah Yahushua Mashiach. Yet I intend to remind you, though you once knew this, that Yahuwah, having delivered a people out of the land of Mitzrayim, afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the messengers who did not keep their own principality, but left their own dwelling. He has kept in everlasting shackles under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And those would be the messengers that mated with women, 200 in all. They were buried in, in, in the ground with hard rocks over top of them, chained in darkness and shackled until they were going to be dug out and thrown into the lake of fire. And yeah, they have no forgiveness. There was, no, there was no, no time in which they're not suffering until they are thrown in there because of what they chose to do. And it's because of this very thing, the horrific judgment against those messengers that should have known better, that had no forgiveness or chance for repentance, that no messengers will ever do that again because they know the reward in store for them. You know, uh, on that line, I, I was, I've been, you know, reading through that. And um, so when uh, Lucifer, Satan was cast out of, Shamayim. He took with him a third of the other messengers, right? It says that, yeah, a third of them fell with him. Onto the earth. So, are those the messengers that went into this, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the, they found wives? I forget how they put it. I wanted you to say it the right way. Are those the ones that did that? Not all of them, but that was a portion of them. The 200, right? The 200 watchers uh, did that, the, where they had to watch their their children, their, the giants, destroy themselves. Um, right. Just for clarification, the watchers were sent by Yahuwah to be the judges of men, to teach men righteousness as the sons of Adam were increasing on the earth. Right. They... Of those, 200 of them chose to do what they did, but it wasn't all of them. 
and any messengers that turn from serving Yahuwah are under the authority of Satan. So that and does answer. Are they roaming question. the earth right now, these messengers? The ones that didn't mate with women are still doing his will throughout the world, sub subject to Satan. Yes. And this would be what they call the hierarchy for the occultic stuff. I'm not really into that, but the hierarchy is the, the pagan mighty ones of old. You had the supreme mighty one and then the lower levels. And this would be Satan and the lower level chief messengers or evil messengers and then demons or their progeny. Yeah, the demons were supposedly, from what I was reading in Hanak, is that the demons are the ones that were basically the the nephilim and when they all when they all died off whatever their it said that the the what was left was their spirit or the, their soul or the spirit which were the uh, were the na were named demons so they're the ones left from the the combination of humans and and messengers together that's what from what i'm understanding in Han hanak men and messengers yes i know you didn't do that on purpose but they have that that connotation for human that means the natural man from scripture right right but the the messengers that mated with women they had the massively large giants that were it says 2000 or 3000 elim yeah which is like 500 feet or 400 feet no 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 <laughs> sorry yeah, it's 1.2 miles tall no, that, really, it's that. I thought it was. So, yeah, wow. That, that's why. Yeah, that's why he puts it cryptically in a weird measurement like that because he didn't want to just straight say it. It, it seemed disbelievable to him, but it, you can get the confirmation for that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the Damascus document, of, in the exhortation under the Damascus document, and also in Second Baruch. But in the exhortation, it says that the, the messenger's children, which were mountains high and tall as cedars, right? If you remember trees, they have evidence that trees were massively tall back then. So they were like, this, so they were, they were, oh, wow. Wow, those are some yeah. pretty, that's yes. where, uh, that's where the uh, Titans, yes. The, titan, the Greeks get the Titans from. So they weren't, they distorted it, but they weren't, they were basing it on reality. Yes, and they were perverted with, okay, so the, I'll give you that in just a moment, but the, the Titans, if you will, the largest of them, they had the next step down, and then they had the next step down, and it was once they ran out of being able to feed them, the Titans would eat the, the next step down, and those ones would eat the giants, and the giants would eat themselves and men. So, so, you they, had, wiped them, so they practically wiped themselves out, and, and Goliath was a leftover of those, those guys, I guess, right? Yeah, well, that, that's after the flood is a, is a kind of a separate issue. It has to do with witchcraft and what was carried over with the, what corrupted DNA potentially. But I don't, we don't have the evidence for that anywhere written, so I don't want to speculate. All right, cool. But I know witchcraft is involved with it, and that's a that, that's what we're going to get into with the recognitions as we read it. You'll you'll see that very clearly. But um, these. The whole story with the, the perversion of the, the Greek mythology, it was the original history of what happened that got twisted and perverted exactly like you're thinking. And that's how you can have that. And they, they, you can even see today, they have some very compelling evidence about giants and things that were petrified into stone. I mean, you can look at the hair follicles in, inside the pore of a, of a man's arm. And then there's pictures of those very things that people are walking through that are caves in the ground where they're walking by these massively large hair follicles that are curly and everything, just like the pictures you see in an anatomy book. And then there's some really compelling evidence of very large bodies that used to exist. Uh, just, I'd love to check that out. Where, where, where is their, their resource? I would love to see the pictures of that. I'll try to find it. I know there's, if you look on YouTube, if they still have it, there's a gentleman that did called Mud Fossil Academy. Okay. And he, I don't know if he's a believer, but he shows evidence of massively large bones, structures, hands, feet, and actual living tissue that he's had tested that's come back as man's DNA 
from from things that were like there was a, a palm that was 36 inches across from a man that would have been almost 25 feet tall wow and it was petrified it was it was made into solid rock he has a lot of that stuff that he's personally mud fossils is what he calls it mud fossil academy is the youtube channel i can't say i, I agree with everything i haven't watched all his videos but he actually had the stuff genetically tested and shows that it's man's dna in these things that are massively large finger digits that are bigger than his head <laughs> do they have evidence of giants being a mile tall some of the pictures from these things are like mountains and things like that yeah wow you'll see now we, we don't have as much as we could have it's been a very long time but you, you can see there's very compelling evidence for these things that were actually real one of the biggest ones is greek mythology the fact that these things were carried down when you read alexander hislop's two babylons and you ties in how all of the mystery religions were teaching the history of creation in a perverted sense it, it makes more sense that way as well because the greeks carried that the hebrews leaving mitzrayim carried the mystery religion from egypt that came out of babylon with them when they were planting things I don't know all the history behind it. I haven't had the chance or pleasure to study that out in depth, but it's possible that May Hole, it's, it, it's a read somewhere, or I've heard from someone that May Hole, who was known as the first Scythian or dweller in tents and sojourner, if you will, who was also known as the um, Phenisi of Farsa, who founded Phoenicia, right? His children founded different city-states in Greece and other places, Spain, and eventually Ireland, where they were the leaders over the, the, the children that were migrating to those places, because the leader was coming from the seed of Yahuda, if you recall. But back on point, Mahol had went and started, founded universities in Babylon, where he learned from them, and he went and taught those things where he went, they said. And that's how they started this errant worship but the greeks were in a sorry state the original sons of yepheth were in a sorry state when the hebrews were founding city-states in their area the kingdom of attica athens thebes eventually sparta the lacedaemonian kingdom which were the corinthians were eventually these are all Hebrew peoples that were founding city-states there, and they intermixed with them and became the Greeks that carried down in history. I'm getting sidetracked there, sorry. Point is, to get back on track, the messengers that mated with women, they were judged and punished immediately. They are currently in darkness, suffering as we speak. And they will do so until they are dug out and thrown into the lake of fire with no forgiveness. And that is for that very reason that there's no messengers that's going to do that same kind of sin. It, they know the punishment in store for them. It would be even worse for them because they already see the effects of that kind of thing. But to continue, it says, even in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities around them in a similar way to these, having given themselves over to harlotry and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, undergoing arbitrational or judgmental punishment of everlasting fire. In the same way, indeed, these dreamers defile the flesh and reject authority and speak evil of esteemed ones. That's something that we should be very, very careful to do. Anyone who's been esteemed to be a martyr, anyone who's spoken of well by the, the standards in the word, we don't want to be speaking evil of because we will be putting ourselves in the condition of being these people. But Mikhail, the chief messenger, in, contend in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moshe, presumed not to bring against him a blasphemous accusation, but said, Yahuwah rebuke you. Yet these blaspheme that which they do not know, 
and that which they know naturally, like unreasoning beasts, in these they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, because they have gone the way of Cain, or in the way of Cain, who killed his brother through jealousy, and gave themselves up to the delusion of Bilam for a reward. Bilam means not of the people. Is that Baal or is that a... Yeah, Balaam. Balaam. It means literally his name means not the people. Not of the people. And if you recall, he wanted a reward for his foretelling. And while he could not curse the children, he taught them, he taught them how they could get them to curse themselves. Mm. And then perished in the rebellion of Korok. Korok was a son of Louis in the wilderness who rose up with the Reubenites and some others against Moshe and Aaron, of the rightful reign. So during the time of the wilderness, Louis, in collusion with Reuben, which if you remember, Reuben went up to his father's house and defiled the couch of his wife, right, or his concubine. That was a picture of the same kind of thing. But Louis, in collusion with Reuben, would, would rise up against Moshe and be consumed by fire in the wilderness. If you recall, Reuben represents France, French Canadians, and, and what they're doing to help overthrow the real belief. It, it's a picture of what would happen in the future as well. This is these are rocky reefs in your love feasts feasting with you, feeding themselves without fear, waterless clouds borne about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, wild waves of the sea foaming up their own shame, strange stars for whom the blackness of darkness is kept forever. And Hanok, the seventh from Adam, also foretold of these, and this is where you can see right there in the first begin the beginning of what they call first Enoch or the book of Hanok. It says, saying, see, Yahuwah comes with his myriads of Kodeshim to execute judgment on all, to punish all who are wicked among them concerning all their wicked works, which they have committed in a wicked way, and concerning all the harsh words with which wicked sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, who walk according to their own lusts. And he's the truth. We're supposed to take what happens to us in this life joyfully and cheerfully endure the things that happen. To patiently endure in love and not to retaliate. So if, if we have a bitter word or something happens that's upsetting, that's where we're supposed to not complain or grumble, but to show his ruach in you, not walking according to our own lust, but according to his will, humbly submitting to the imitation of what our Mashiach walked out when he was persecuted. And that's what he said, that those who endure to the end, the same shall be delivered. To be contrary is to grumble, to complain, to retaliate, to take vengeance. And everyone that does those things in scripture you can see that there is a reward for it that is not a beneficial one. This is these are grumblers, complainers who walk according to their own lusts, and their mouth speaks proudly, admiring faces for the sake of gain. But you, beloved ones, remember the words spoken by the emissaries of our Yahuwah Yahushua Mashiach, because they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own wicked lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, not having the Ruach. Yet you, beloved ones, building yourselves up on your most set-apart belief, praying in the set-apart Ruach, keep yourselves in the love of Elohim, looking for the compassion of our Yahuwah Yahushua Mashiach, unto everlasting life and show compassion towards some who are doubting but others deliver with fear snatching them out of the fire hating even the garment defiled by the flesh 
and to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you perfect before the presence of his esteem with exceeding joy to the only Hakam or wise Elohim, our deliverer, be esteem and greatness and might and authority, both now and forever. Amen. The next section here is from the recognitions of Clement. I don't have the book on hand here, but this is from chapter 34. It says, The Temptation of Mashiach. It says, This we would have you know assuredly, that a demon has no power against a man unless one voluntarily submit to himself to his desires. Meaning, they have no authority over you unless you put yourself under their jurisdiction. Sounds when, like court. What's that? Well, the tribunals that we have in our country. Right. If you put yourself under the jurisdiction, then you're under the authority. Otherwise, they have none. Amen. It says, whence even that one who is the prince of immorality approached him who, as we have said, is appointed of Yahuwah, sovereign of Shalom, tempting him and began to promise him all the kabod or steam of the world, because he knew that when he had offered this to others for the sake of deceiving them, they had worshipped him. Therefore, disobedient as he was and unmindful of himself, which indeed is the special peculiarity of immorality, he presumed that he should be worshipped by him by whom he knew that he was to be destroyed. Therefore, our master, confirming the worship of one Yahuwah, answered him, It is written, You shall worship Yahuwah your Elohim, and him only will you serve. And he, terrified by this answer, and fearing lest the true obedience of the one and true Yahuwah should be restored, hastened straightway to send forth into this world false prophets and false apostles and false teachers, who should speak indeed in the name of Mashiach, but should accomplish the will of the demon. So observe the greatest caution that you believe no teacher, unless he bring from Yerushalayim the testimonial of Yaakov, Yahushua's brother, or of whosoever may come after him. And I want you to keep special attention. Go throughout the epistles, every one of them. Go throughout the book of Acts. Go throughout the, those writings of when they were given the commission and they went out to do these things. And you're going to find them doing that very thing. They received testimony and letters of commendation and recommendation from Yerushalayim to the approved ones. And they were sent out as legitimate teachers of the truth. It wasn't just willy-nilly anybody being received. And that's something that you can actually prove in the common scriptures by themselves. The, the scriptures that are common to all of us, meaning the 66 books that everyone is familiar with today. It was originally 88 before the Apocrypha was removed, but those are in contradiction to the hidden or not so common scriptures, like all the writings that were in the Dead Sea Scrolls that were not known to anybody. <clears throat> but fourth Ezra, when he was given the Ruach to dictate to five scribes and have them make copies of all the writings before he was taken to paradise, he was enjoined by Yahuwah, our Mashiach, to publish the 24 books openly for the worthy and the unworthy. And that was what we call the Old Testament or original covenant writings. And then the other writings, the 70 or more, depending on what version you read, were to be kept hidden. And it was only for the intelligent and hakam or wise amongst the people, because in it were all the storehouses of knowledge and folklore. And it was not meant for everyone. So this is a theme you can see in the scriptures common to us all, though. And I encourage you all to test this very thing. You'll find it throughout the writings where even Shaul, he's writing about the people that are with him and those being sent out to do things that are approved and should be accepted when they come. For that very same reason. <clears throat> so continuing here. 
It says, for no one unless he has gone up thither and there has been approved as a fit and trustworthy teacher for preaching the word of Mashiach. Unless I say he brings a testimonial thence is by any means to be received. But let neither foreteller nor sent one be looked for by you at this time besides us. For there is one true foreteller whose words we twelve sent ones preach. For he is the accepted year of Yahuwah, having us sent ones as his twelve months. But for what reason the world itself was made, or what diversities have occurred in it, and why our master coming for its restoration has chosen and sent us twelve sent ones, will be explained more at length at another time. Meantime, he has commanded us to go forth to preach and to invite you to the supper of the Shamayim sovereign, which the father has prepared for the marriage of his son, and that we should give you wedding garments, that is, the favor of immersion, which whosoever obtains as a spotless robe with which he is to enter to the supper of the sovereign ought to beware that it be not in any part of it stained with sin, and so he be rejected as unworthy and reprobate. Yet the ways in which this garment may be spotted are these, and this is something that's important for everybody. If you're a believer that's been immersed already in the name of Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach, unto deliverance for everlasting life, and to be sealed with his Ruach, then these are things that can cause you to fatally lose your anointing. Meaning that after being receiving of it, you can lose it. This is yet the ways in which this garment may be spotted are these. If anyone withdraw from Yahuwah the Father and creator of all, receiving another teacher besides Mashiach, who is the word of Elohim who alone is the trustworthy and true foreteller and who has sent us 12 sent ones to preach the word. If anyone think otherwise than worthily of the substance of Yahuwah, which excels all things. These are the things that even fatally pollute the armor of immersion. But the things that pollute it in actions are these murders, adulteries, hatreds, Erevis, which is greed, and evil ambition, and the things that pollute at once the Ruach and the body are these, to partake of the table of demons, that is, to taste things sacrificed, or blood, or a carcass that is strangled, and if there be aught else that has been offered to demons." Be this, therefore, the first step to you of three, which brings forth 30 commands, and the second 60, and the third 100, as we will expound more fully to you at another time. Meaning that if you do the first steps here, it really covers a whole bunch more of commands that are given throughout Scripture that, that reiterate the same topics. This is also from the Recognitions. It is the interpretation of scripture. It says, then Kepha, commending his statement, said, ingenious men, as I perceive, take many, or take many counterfeits looking much like truth from the things that they read. And therefore, great care is to be taken that when the Torah of Elohim is read, it be not read according to the comprehension of our own mind. And this is something that I actually talk to my children quite a bit about too. It's not just when it's the Torah, but if you're reading anything that isn't Torah, we should never take that and consider it to be valid for anything truthful until you've lined it up with what is in his word. Because the Torah is the truth and the truth is the foundation upon which we have to stand. So everything has to be held to the standard of what's written in his word. 
This is for there are many sayings in the set of part scriptures that can be drawn to that sense that everyone has preconceived for himself, and this ought not to be done. For you ought not to seek a foreign and extraneous sense, which you have brought from without, which you may confirm from the authority of the scriptures. And this is what they call sound bite theology. You have a topic or a point of view, and then you prove it using a verse here and a verse there to confirm an opinion, but it's not something that's actually taught in the scriptures itself. This is, but to take the sense of truth from the scriptures themselves. Wait, 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 wait just stop there for a second. I want to just meditate on that. For you ought not to seek a foreign and extra, extraneous sense Ex you have. Mm -hmm. Extraneous sense, yeah. Extra, yeah extra, extraneous sense, which you have brought with, from without, which you may confirm from authority of the scriptures, but to take the sense of truth from scriptures themselves. So what do you say? I mean, like a lot of times what we do is we will go to historic events and how and see how it lines up. Like, for example, like we know that the history of the Roman Holy, the, the Holy Roman Empire, how it, how it was just continually just destroying any anybody that's not catholic and then we could take scripture and you know like revelations and we could see how that lines up with that you know that there's nothing wrong with that right it's right no see that's the whole thing we should do nothing and take nothing from the scriptures that you can't prove is taught from it or right here is what or the sense is because look it's going to tell you but to take the sense of the truth from the scriptures themselves, and therefore it behooves you to learn the meaning of the scriptures from him who keeps it according to the truth handed down to him from his fathers, so that he can authoritatively declare what he has rightly received. And the example we'll see later in a little bit here too. Moshe was given the truth. And then he gave that truth to the elders and the chiefs of the people that came to him. And then they all collectively were to teach the people. But they were only to hand, they were only to give to the people what they had received from Moshe. And Moshe only gave to them what he had received from our Mashiach. And Mashiach only gave to Moshe what he had received from the Father. So it was a continual pattern in that same sense. Right. In that very same pattern. He established the Father sent our Mashiach in the flesh. The Mashiach anointed his 12, the 12 chose, uh, the, and then he sent out his taught ones, right? The, the, the group of them, but not all stayed with it. Some fell away. That also has to do with the constellations and the different stars and stuff, but that's getting digression. The point is, when they were anointed and all came together of one mind, there was about 120 of them. So of those 120, 12 were the emissaries. The rest were teachers or other forms of, of ministers given the Ruach in different capacities. But they would have been like the our Mashiach and then the 12 and then the 72 in the same picture. Right? Right. The, the, just, uh, the way I'm looking at that is uh, uh, when it's a foreign and extraneous sources um this right um, so it's not talking about historical evidence it's talking about some vain some vain philosophy that you know that that was taken out of context or something that i could, that is that what should i understand it that way right this is here's a good example you have the creation account what's clearly stated in scripture that, and then you have the other allusions to it in the Psalms and other places in the, in the epistles where it says that the scriptures, the world was created by our Mashiach speaking things into existence and holding it together by the, the word of his power. There is no other force doing so. Now you have Greek philosophy from over 2000 years ago that came up through the instigation of demons with atomic theory. And eventually it was brought into the scientific realm where you have atomic theory considered actual science 
when it's nothing that's ever been proven. But they use that. And so men will take this idea that's in science and try to apply scripture to prove it when that's nowhere in the scriptures. And you actually have places in the recognitions where Kepha refutes or his taught ones are refuting atomic theory explicitly. There's other wow, things. So saying the way, the way we make nuclear bombs and hydrogen bombs is not the way they're telling us how they make it. Right. In the fields of chemistry, everything. It, yeah, there's massive amounts of lies and disinformation that it's just like astrology. What people call fate or that form of witchcraft they use with the, the stars. The only reason why it's effective is because demons delude the minds of men into making it seem legitimate. And script, but scripture says, as a man reckons in his life, so is he. Well, because you, I, 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 um, I took, I, I, I was an engineer for six years, and a lot, and in school, I studied some of the really high level physics and chemistry. I also studied, and uh, it all made sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. The, I was looking at more and more of that, but I was watching some things about water too. If you, they use that as a way of explaining it, but it's a crutch they don't even get because molecules and elements don't function that way. It, they go from a presumptive basis, but in reality, an atom has never been seen. It's never been demonstrated. It's never been isolated. It's never been proven to exist. Wow, you know, you, with this, wow, dude, uh, wow. I just, uh, I, I was I worked on I was a systems engineer I, I worked on the systems navigation for a lot of the uh, the A6 F14 the bombers and my job was uh, write the algorithms for uh, directing the aircraft I, and believe me I wasn't no expert on it I had other people that I worked with but uh, the way we used to calculate this stuff and you know we take it from a board and put it into a, a program and you know develop a program. And everything we did was based on a on a, uh, a a circular Earth, and I, I, it blows me away. I, it, I oh, and it, and it, and it wasn't. It, it, I'm I'm speechless. I don't know how we did it. I don't know how we made the stuff work. Right, it blows me away. I must have been uh, wow. You reminded me. I'll I'll share it with you after or later on. There was a few videos that were done by somebody about what NASA and different government records that have been released actually say about the shape of creation. And it's all like aeronautic studies and different things based on flat plane near earth, non-rotating earth over and over again. That's I, I what they base it on. Yeah, I used the equations they gave me and, and I, you know, customized it to whatever situation I was in, you right. know, like how high the aircraft was. I want to shoot a missile. That's 2,000 miles away at this particular target with a Latin log and a height and all this other stuff. And I just used the equations they gave me, but I would just doctor them up to, you know, every situation has its own unique circumstances. And and, and uh, it's amazing. It, it was like, wow, blows me away. I well, like, how, how do we make it work? I don't know. You, you got to keep in mind the math works for the heliocentric theory too, the theory of relativity, the math that Einstein put together the computations function but it was still telling a lie and something that isn't real it was just a way to compute it to make the math work it, yeah it, i saw that with einstein too in uh, one of the one of the vids they they said that no one ever really understood his theory of relativity no one really not the highest brains that they were like they said like just accept it it, it works don't worry about it you know don't worry about the details yeah. king's dethrone is the one you really want to look up it actually, the gentleman went over the theory, explains it, and shows how it was just a, a whole bunch of different blunders through history that caused this giant mistake <laughs> in science. Wow. Kings dethroned by, um, oh, what's his name? Can we find the book? I don't have that book here. It's online. Oh. The, the audio book was by, it was read by someone that I don't recommend. It's on YouTube? Yes. Kings dethroned? Yes, it, you, you'll be able to find it there. I, I can't remember his name. But anyways, we're getting sidetracked too far. Sorry about that. This stuff right here is important. And the idea, the whole sense of it is, like I've been saying, Shaul says in his epistle that he put down these things for the believers in figures of considering himself and Apollos 
so that they would learn to not think beyond what is written. And that's exactly what Kepha is saying right here. I'll read it again just so we can get continuity. It says, for you ought not to seek a foreign and extraneous sense which you have brought from without, which you may confirm from the authority of the scriptures, but to take the sense of the truth from the scriptures themselves, and therefore it behooves you to learn the meaning of the scriptures from him who keeps it according to the truth handed down to him from his fathers, so that he can authoritatively declare what he has rightly received. Yet, when one has received an entire and firm rule of truth from the scriptures, it will not be improper if he contribute to the establishment of true doctrine anything from common education and from liberal studies, which it may be he has attached himself to in his boyhood. Yet, so that, when he has learned the truth, he renounce falsehood and pretense. The next section is from 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 8. It says, Let a man regard us as servants of Mashiach and trustees of the secrets of Elohim. For the rest, it is sought in trustees that those should be found trustworthy. But with the trustees have a fiduciary responsibility. <laughs> that absolutely. And who's the beneficiaries of the trust? We are the people. So those, the servants of Mashiach and trustees of the secrets of Elohim, meaning that they have to give the secrets of Elohim for the benefit of the people, and they have a fiduciary obligation to do so. Awesome. However, they're enjoined not to throw their pearls before men acting like dogs and swine. So they, they have a fiduciary obligation to our Mashiach's rules as the trustees. Awesome. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can carry that over for their trust laws and how they're supposed to be for our benefit as well. It, it, it is the same because this is common law trust issues right here. Excellent. This is for the rest. It is sought in trustees that those should be found trustworthy but with me, it is a small matter that I should be judged by you or by a man's court, but not even myself I judge, for I am not conscious of any against myself, yet I am not declared right by this, but he who judges me is Yahuwah. So do not judge any at all before the time, until Yahuwah comes, who shall bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal reveal the thoughts of the hearts and then each one's praise shall come from elohim and these brothers i have applied in a figure to myself and apollos for your sakes so that in us you might learn not to think beyond what is written so that none of you be puffed up on behalf of one against the other for who makes you to differ and what do you have that you did not receive and if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already satisfied. You are already enriched. You have reigned as sovereigns apart from us, and I desire indeed you did reign, that we also might reign with you. This is from Second Kepha, chapter 1, 17 through 21. It says, for when he received respect and esteem from Elohim the Father, such a voice came to him from the excellent esteem. This is my son, the beloved in whom I did delight. And that is an allusion to Proverbs 8. And we heard this voice which came from Shamayim when we were with him on the set apart mountain. And we have the foretelling, the foretelling word made more certain, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the yom dawns and the dawn star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no foretelling of scripture came to be of one's own interpretation. For foretelling never came by the desire of man, 
but men of Elohim spoke, being moved by the Kodesh Ruach. And this is from Book 10 of the Recognitions. This is part of Chapter 13. It says, Then Kepha ordered them to be admitted, for the place was large and convenient. And when they had come in, Kepha said to us, If any one of you desires, let him address the people and discourse concerning idolatry. To whom I, Clement, answered, Your great benignity and gentleness and patience towards all encourages us so that we dare speak in your presence and ask what we please. And therefore, as I said, the gentleness of your disposition invites and encourages all to undertake the precepts of delivering doctrine. This I never saw before in anyone else, but in you only, with whom there is neither envy nor indignation. Or what do you think? Then said, or then Kepha said, these things come not only from envy or indignation, but sometimes there is bashfulness in some persons, fearing that they may not be able to answer fully the questions that may be proposed. And so they avoid the discovery of their want of skill. But no one ought to be ashamed of this because there is no man who ought to profess that he knows all things. For there is only one who knows all things, even he who also made all things. For if our master declared that he knew not the day and the hour whose signs even he foretold and referred the whole to the Father, how will we account it dishonorable to confess that we are ignorant of some things? Since in this we have the example of our master. Yet, and that's a refutation in itself of the Trinity, of anyone being co-equal to the Father, right there. Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach, our sovereign and Elohim, declared himself that he didn't know the day or the hour, but it was in the hand or the, the purview of the Father alone. And he, he said himself that the Father was greater. And there's two more of many, many confirmations of these things that we can find that were brought in later that are contrary to the actual truth that we have to confess and acknowledge. But it says, yet this only we profess, that we know those things that we have learned from the true foreteller, and that those things have been delivered to us by the true foreteller, which he determines to be sufficient for man's knowledge. And that's why we don't have to go beyond the word to guard the commands, which is another thing you'll find uh, another reference for these. I don't know if I have it in this writing here or not, but in Kohelet, Ecclesiastics chapter 12, the last chapter, at the end of it, it goes over the whole duty of man. And if you go a little bit before the part where it says it's to guard the commandments of Elohim, it talks about how there's making of many books, but the, the words of Hokma are all gathered by the master of collections, and they're, they're held by one shepherd, meaning the, the words that goad you into right living all come from the truth, and his words are meant for your edification and benefit. But to continue, it says, Then I, Clement, went on to speak thus at Tripoli's when you were disputing against the nations, my master Kepha. I greatly wondered at you that although you were instructed by your father according to the fashion of the Hebrews and in observances of your own Torah and were never polluted by the studies of Greek learning, you argued so magnificently and so incomparably and that you even touched upon some things concerning the histories of the false mighty ones, which are usually declaimed in the theaters. But as, but as I perceived that their fables and blasphemies were not so well known to you, I will discourse upon these in your hearing, repeating them from the very beginning, if it pleases you. Did you have something to say real quick? No. Okay. Then says Kepha, say on, you do well to assist my preaching. 
Then I said, I will speak, therefore, because you order me, not by way of teaching you, but of making public what foolish opinions the nations entertain of the false mighty ones. Yet, when I was about to speak, Nisita, biting his lip, beckoned to me to be silent. And when Cephas saw him, he said, why would you repress the, his liberal disposition and noble nature, that you would have him be silent for my honor, which is nothing. Or do you not know that if all tribes, after they have heard from me the preaching of the truth and have believed, would betake themselves to teaching, they would gain the greater esteem for me, if indeed you think me desirous of esteem. For what so esteem, or what is so esteemed as to prepare taught ones for Mashiach, not who will be silent and will be delivered alone, but who will speak what they have learned and will do good to others. I desire indeed that both you, Nasita, and you, beloved Aquila, would aid me in preaching the word of Elohim, and the rather because those things in which the nations err are well known to you, and not only, or and not you only, but all who hear me, I desire, as I have said, so to hear and to learn that they may be able also to teach. For the world needs many helpers by whom men may be recalled from error. When he had spoken thus, he said to me, go on then, Clement, with what you have begun. And then this is a different chapter later on. This is a trustworthy saying and worthy of all accept acceptation. Yet if anyone desires to learn exactly the truth of our preaching, let him come to hear. Let him ascertain what the true foreteller Yahushua is, and then at length all doubtfulness will cease to him, unless with obstinate mind he resists those things that he finds to be true. For there are some whose only object it is to gain the victory in any way whatever, and who seek praise for this rather than their deliverance. These ought not to have a single word addressed to them, lest both the noble word suffer injury and condemn to ageless death him who is guilty of the wrong done to it. For what is there in respect of which anyone ought to oppose our preaching, or in respect of which the word of our preaching is found to be contrary to the word or to the belief of what is true and honorable. It says that Yahuwah the Father, the creator of all, is to be honored, as also his Son, who alone knows him and his will, and who alone is to be believed concerning all things that he has enjoined. For he alone is the Torah and the Torah giver, and the righteous judge, whose law decrees that Yahuwah, who is Elohim of all, is to be honored by a sober, chaste, righteous, and merciful existence, and that all expectation is to be placed in him alone. Second Timothy, or sorry, Second Timothy three, chapter or verses one through seventeen. <clears throat> this is yet know this that in the last days, or Yamim, hard times shall come. For men shall be lovers of self, lovers of silver, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, thankless, wrongdoers, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, fierce, haters of good, betrayers, reckless, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of Elohim, having a form of reverence or fear, but denying its power and turn away from these. For among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, 
always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And as Yohain and Mamre opposed Moshe, those are the two magicians that were in Mitzrayim or Egypt, if you will. Yeah. All right. So as Yohan and Mamre opposed Moshe, so did these also oppose the truth. Men of corrupt minds found worthless concerning the belief. But they shall not go on further, for their folly shall be obvious to all, as also that of those men became. Yet you did closely follow my teaching, the way of life, the purpose, the belief, the patience, the love, the endurance, the persecutions, the sufferings which came to me at Antioch, at Iconia, and at Lustra, what persecutions I bore. Yet out of them all, Yahuwah delivered me. And indeed, all those desiring to live reverently or fearfully in Mashiach Yahushua shall be persecuted. But evil men and impostors shall go on to the worse, leading astray and being led astray. But you stay in what you have learned and trusted, having known from whom you have learned, and that from a babe you have known the set-apart scriptures, which are able to make you hakam or wise, for the deliverance through belief in Mashiach Yahushua. All scripture is breathed out by Elohim and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for, for setting straight, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of Elohim might be fitted, equipped for every tov work. This is 2 Kepha 3, 1 through 18. It says, this is now, beloved ones, the second letter I write to you in which I stir up your sincere mind to remember the words previously spoken by the set apart foretellers and of the command of the master and deliverer by your emissaries, knowing this first, that mockers shall come in the last days with mocking, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all continues as from the beginning of creation. For they choose to have this hidden from them, that the Shemaim were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water by the word of Elohim, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water, and the present Shemaim and the earth are treasured up by the same word, being kept for fire, to a yom of judgment and destruction of wicked men. Yet, beloved ones, let not this one be hidden from you, that with Yahuwah one yom or day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Yahuwah is not slow in regard to the promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards us, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the Yom of Yahuwah shall come as a thief in the night, in which the Shemaim, or firmament, shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with intense heat, and the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Seeing all these are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be in set apart behavior and fear, knowing or looking for and hastening the coming of the Yom of Elohim, through which the Shemaim shall be destroyed, being set on fire, and the elements melt with intense heat? Yet, according to his promise, we wait for a renewed Shemaim and a renewed earth in which righteousness dwells. So then, beloved ones, looking forward to this, do your utmost to be found by him in shalom, spotless and blameless, and reckon the patience of our Yahuwah as deliverance, as also our beloved Shaul wrote to you, according to the chokmah given to him, as also in all letters speaking in them concerning these, in which some are hard to comprehend, 
which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also the other scriptures. You then, beloved ones, being forewarned, watch lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. So you could be steadfast and fall from it. Here's another witness to that. Being led away by or with the delusion of the lawless. But grow in the favor and knowledge of our Yahuwah and deliverer, Yahushua Mashiach. To him be the esteem both now and to the day or a day that abides. Amen. Let me make a, uh, a quick question here. Uh, you know, it's set up on the top there. It says that he doesn't desire for any to perish, but that it, it leads all people to repentance. That made me think of the scripture where it says, many are called, but few are chosen. So how does that line up with that scripture? And uh, what's your opinion of that? Or your what your discovery is on that? It's true. It says he, it's not his desire that any perish, but that all come to knowledge of the truth. Right? Right. The idea is the truth that is presented is meant for all. You're not, you're, everyone is supposed to be told, repent for the, the reign of the, the Malchus Shemayim is drawn near, right. right? And those that will receive the truth and turn in obedience to him, he will accept. But he, it's like he floods the earth to every single human being, the message of repentance and the turn from your wicked criminal ways. But it's, uh, it's, it, it, so they're called, but the few that are chosen are the ones that decided to turn to that repentance, correct? Yes, it's just like in Yehezkiel, or what they call Ezekiel, where he sends them, he says, you speak to them, whether they will hear, whether they will believe, because they are stiff-necked people. He says it to Hosea as well, Husha, if you will. Right. He says, if they will hear, if they won't, for they're stiff-necked people, but you go speak to them. The idea is, you know, he wants them to know so that they have the opportunity to freely choose the right thing. However, if they don't, there will be consequences. And that's what Kefa explains in a few places in the recognitions as well. He says, before the truth came, you were ignorant. And when you're ignorant, you're bound to do things that cause you problems. But when once the truth comes, if you continue in those things that were causing you destruction, you only have yourself to blame for the judgment that's coming upon you. Mm -hmm. Got it. And that's why he says, and Shaul mentioned, uh, Barnabas said it as well. He says, like, if I don't share this with you, it's woe to me. But if you don't receive this destruction, right? Yeah. All right, so it says, you then, beloved ones, being forewarned, watch lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. Being, I already read that one, I'm sorry. Right here, Colossians, this is chapter 1, 9 through 29. This is that is also why we, from the day we heard, have not ceased praying for you and asking that you be filled with the knowledge of his desire in all hokma and ruachmi, or spiritual comprehension. Excuse me. To walk worthily of Yahuwah, pleasing all, Bearing fruit in every tov work and increasing in the knowledge of Elohim, being empowered with all power, according to the might of his esteem, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has made us fit to share in the inheritance of the Kodashim in the light, who has delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred us into the reign of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, who is the likeness of the invisible Elohim, the firstborn of all creation, because in him were created all that are in the Shemaim and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulerships or principalities or authorities, all have been created through him and for him. And he is before all, and in him all hold together. And he is the head of the body, the assembly, who 
who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he might become the one who is first in all. Because in him, all the completeness or all the completeness was, was well pleased to dwell and through him to completely restore to favor all unto himself, whether on earth or in the Shemayim, having made shalom through the blood of his stake. And you, who once were estranged and enemies in the mind by wicked works, but now he has completely restored to favor in the body of his flesh through death, to present you set apart and perfect and unreprovable before him. If, indeed, you continue in the belief, founded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the expectation of the good news which you heard, which was proclaimed to every creature under the Shemayim, of which I, Shaul, became a servant, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in Mashiach's afflictions." For the sake of his body, which is the assembly, of which I became a servant according to the administration of Elohim, which was given to me for you. To fill the word of Elohim, the secret which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his set-apart ones, to whom Elohim desired to make known what are the riches of the esteem of this secret among the nations, which is Mashiach in you, the expectancy of esteem, whom we announce warning every man and teaching every man in all hokma or wisdom, in order to present every man perfect in Mashiach Yahushua, for which I also labor striving according to the working of him who works in me in power. All right. We have just a moment. So we'll, we'll do a few more and then we'll, we'll pause this and we'll finish it up next time. But it says, this is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 16. And again, the whole purpose of this is who we should listen to, how we should determine what is true as per the word. That's the whole theme here. This is, and when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the witness of Elohim. For I resolved not to know anything among you except Yahushua Mashiach and him in pale. So nothing but the word that was given for men, right? And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my word and my preaching were not with pervasive words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Ruach and of power. In order that your belief should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of Elohim. Yet we speak chokmah among those who are perfect and not the wisdom of this age nor of the rulers of this age that are being brought to naught. But we speak the hokma of Elohim, which was hidden in a secret, and which Elohim ordained before the ages for our esteem, which no one of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known, they would not have impilled Yahuwah Kabod, or Yahuwah of esteem, which is a title for our Mashiach on you can find this on Exodus chapter 20, where it's Yahuwah Kabod who appeared in the top of the mountain that was burning with fire. And that is our Mashiach. He's also alluded to in a few other places, Yehezkiel or Ezekiel as Yahuwah Kabod, if I recall correctly. But you see it more in the, in the Hebrew. Otherwise, it'll say Yahuwah of esteem. Or it will say the esteem of Yahuwah, but in the Hebrew it says Yahuwah Kabot. For reference there, if you're not familiar with Hebrew, it's backwards from English. So you have your predicate and your, your verbs and your ad, adjectives that would precede a noun would actually go after it in Hebrew. 
and the ones that go after it in English would go before it in Hebrew. So it's kind of a backwards thing when you're translating. If you're familiar with the fact that English used to be Hebrew and they started speaking it backwards, kind of, it got, it got messed up that way. It makes sense why that happened. It is still similar. It functions in the exact same format in the Celtic languages still, or Gaelic, if you will. The Highlander, Scotland, which came from what we call the Caledonians, the Welsh, the Irish, they all have different dialects of broken Hebrew that were influenced in different ways, but they generally keep the same syntax structure and form of the Hebrew. It's just a, it's a sound difference, but it's a word for word, same form in, in the sentence structure and everything. In particular with the Irish and the Highlander Gaelic, by the way. The Welsh had more of an Assyrian influence in their syntax structure when they migrated and were taken into captivity and they carry that with them. That's why it's a little different, but they can use the Welsh language to read the hieroglyphs because of that. It, it's an interesting connection there. If you want more on that, there was a general, there's two gentlemen, Wilson and Blackett, I believe, and they wrote a wealth of books on the topic that are reprinted by a gentleman today. One of them is called Moses in the Hieroglyphs, and another one is the the Kumri, the Kumri. Oh, I can't remember. I have to, it, it's something to do with the language, but it has to do with reading the hieroglyphs using the Welsh language sentence structure. It's pretty interesting. I haven't really gotten into it very much. It's not my area of expertise. But moving on, it says, they would not have impaled Yahuwah of esteem or but as it has been written, eye has not seen and ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man what Elohim has prepared for those who love him. Yet Elohim has revealed them to us through his Ruach, for the Ruach searches all, even the depths of Elohim. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Ruach of the man that is in him? So also the thoughts of Elohim, no one has known except the Ruach of Elohim. And we have received not the Ruach of the world, but the Ruach that is from Elohim, in order to know what Elohim has favorably given us, which we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Kodesh Ruach teaches. Comparing Ruachni with Ruachni, or spiritual with spiritual. Yet the natural man does not receive that of the Ruach of Elohim. And it's actually this verse right here that Satan uses the natural man jurisdiction for all the civil statutes. And to cover that natural man definition, they just use human and they use a, a roundabout way to define human as the natural man of scripture, quoting this very verse. In legal definitions, in, in law, in our country. So it, it's, not, it's not common law. That's, it's already established common law because scripture is common law. So that, that's not my point. The, the definition of human is the natural man, which is what is under the jurisdiction of Rome or the civil law, because they have they cannot receive the things of the Ruach. And that's why everything applies to the, the natural man or the individual and the person, because the natural man is the human, and the human is a reprobate, which is under Satan's jurisdiction. Does that make sense to you? I mean, it's it can't be any simpler. People just they don't get the concept of it's a religious, all law is religious. And if you're not going to be obedient to your maker, then you're going to be subject to the other one. Right. The, 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 yet the natural man does not receive that of the Ruach of Elohim. Yeah, so if we don't receive the, the Ruach Elohim, we are under the jurisdiction of the evil one. 
which is all those civil statutes, the, the yeah. law of the city, which is literally Satan's usurpation. Remember, it says that he wanted to become like the Most High, to exalt himself above all that is called Elohim. Mm -hmm. So he, he has his own laws. He has his own words that his people right. follow. Right. right? <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, now that yeah, it, that's really clarified that. Wow, there's two systems. It's Elohim's system and and uh, and Satan's system, and it's up to us who we choose to be under. Literally, and yeah. this is something I'll show you the PDF I found, or I made it into a PDF, one of the two. But the common law jurisdiction: America, Great Britain, Australia some parts of Africa. It's where the children of Yahusafar, it's where the common law jurisdiction is that stone kingdom that it grew up in the midst of the other ones that will not yield its sovereignty to another that will crush all other rules and authorities when he comes. But that, that's the difference. The two laws in the, in the world today is the common law, which is the scripture it's the Ten Commandments. It's the right rulings. Men have defined it as things otherwise, but we're, we're lying to ourselves. And it's only, in, it's only when we conform completely to his will in every aspect that he desired, that's when things will change for our benefit. But the common law is scripture, and the opposite of that is what they call the law of the city. It came out of Babylon. It even precedes that. If you remember, Cain killed Abel. He was cursed from growing fruits from the ground, and he built a city to live in. The laws of the city were established through satanic means or adversarial ways. It's, it's a contrary system to do not to another what you would hate to have done to you. Right. That's why I truly believe that the Constitution and the common law in this country will never be completely destroyed because I, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. For a time, it's repressed, but it's the same as we're living like the time of the Book of Judges. Gideon was of Manasseh. That's a foreshadow of America in a reverse. After the times of Gideon, you had Ephraim ruling as a monarchy. But you flip around the times after our Mashiach came, you had the monarchies. And then afterwards, you had the, the non-monarch, the time of Judges, if you will, where everyone's 